the arrival of European settlers to what is now the United States. It's estimated that the lower 48 states were covered with over 221 million acres of wetlands. Over half of those wetlands are now gone. In Florida, wetlands covered over 54% of the surface area in the 1700s, and nearly half of those wetlands are now gone. Worldwide, the losses of wetlands are even worse. A 2014 study estimated that somewhere between 50% and 87% of the global wetlands have disappeared. Let that sink in for a moment. Somewhere between 50 and 87 percent of our wetlands worldwide are gone, mainly due to human modification of the landscape. Why have we drained these wetlands? For those early European settlers, it was often driven by a desire to have land suitable for farming within short distances of settlements. Some of the reasoning was aesthetic. Wetlands were considered to be ugly, smelly, generally worthless. They were even thought to be scary. Many an antagonist from mythologies worldwide arose from the swamps to terrify unsuspecting victims, just as the headless horseman of Washington Irving's The Legend of Sleepy Hollow did, or Grendel from the epic Beowulf. There were also health concerns for those living near wetlands. Standing water provides breeding ground for mosquitoes, a common vector of diseases such as malaria, and the water could harbor microorganisms that might make people sick. While some attitudes began to shift over time towards finding beauty in wetlands, many still consider these lands to be largely worthless, an attitude I've often heard expressed in my lifetime. The land is just thought to be of much more value if it's drained and used for urban or industrial development or agriculture. Scientists, however, disagree about this perceived lack of worth. Many ecologists and economists have worked to quantify the value of wetlands. This is not an easy feat. We call the benefits that an ecosystem provides to us ecosystem services. These services are extraordinarily difficult to value. We can divide ecosystem services into four categories, provisioning, cultural, regulating, and supporting. Provisioning services include goods, like raw materials, food, medicinal plants. These goods are the easiest to value because we can sell them. Cultural services improve human well-being and include use of land for things like recreation, tourism, spiritualism, or appreciation of aesthetic values. These cultural services are harder to value, but may include use of land as a park, which generates revenue. Most difficult to value are the regulating and supporting services. Regulating services include things like recycling of oxygen into the air, carbon sequestration, filtration of air and water, regulation of water flow, recharge of the aquifers where we get our drinking water, moderation of drought and flooding events, pollination, pollination and soil erosion prevention, including many other crucial functions of the natural world. Supporting services include things like habitat and genetic diversity. Many of these services are very difficult to value, but we might consider them priceless because we don't have a way to replace these functions if the ecosystem ceases to perform them, and our very lives depend upon many of these services. So, what have we come up with as far as monetary value for ecosystems in general and wetlands in particular? Globally, the current best estimate places a value of over $109 trillion a year on ecosystem services. This figure, by the way, is greater than the current gross domestic product for all of planet Earth. The portion of this value assigned to wetlands is over $47.4 trillion per year. $47.4 trillion a year. This is especially incredible when we consider that wetlands only account for about 3 to 6% of the Earth's surface, 
yet they deliver over 40% of the total estimated global monetary value provided by natural ecosystem services. Remember, some of these services do generate direct income, but many of these services are not being factored into traditional economic analyses. So people are not taking this value into account when they determine the fate of wetlands. If we can agree that ecosystem services are of immense value and may be irreplaceable, then the natural conclusion is that we should work to conserve the wetlands that we still have. The good news is that in Florida, we have dramatically slowed the rate of loss of wetlands since the 1970s. There are a number of factors that have contributed to this. The elimination of public incentives to drain wetlands, federal, state, and local legislation, ordinances, protection initiatives, and public outreach, to name a few. It will be important that we work to keep up these trends of slowing losses, but what can we do about the millions of acres we've lost in Florida alone? Let's revisit a few of the numbers regarding those losses of wetlands. To reiterate, in Florida, nearly half of our original wetlands are already gone. Worldwide, somewhere between half and 87% of our wetlands have already disappeared. If the remaining wetlands still provide over $47.4 trillion a year in ecosystem services, then we've lost a tremendous amount of value with those disappearing wetlands. Meanwhile, human population is skyrocketing, the rate increasing every day as we rapidly approach 8 billion people. That's a mark that we're going to reach any time now. That increasing population puts more and more strain on the ecosystems that we do still have, making it more difficult for them to continue to perform those ecosystem services. Ideally, we could also restore former wetlands. This would add back some of those lost ecosystem services and would strengthen and support the wetlands that we currently still have. However, restoration of wetlands or any disturbed natural area is incredibly difficult. It's not as simple as reflooding these sites and leaving them alone. Some of the challenges to restoration include changes to the soil chemistry, potential contamination from chemicals, invasive species, and changes to the hydrology of a site, to name a few. Let's visit some of those challenges in more detail. First, soil. Standing water reduces oxygen in a soil. This, in turn, will slow the rate of decomposition. In turn, organic matter will build up. That traps nutrients in that location. If we then drain the water, oxygen is reintroduced, decomposition speeds back up, and that organic matter breaks down, releasing those nutrients into the environment. Reflooding a site will not reverse this process because of changes to the soil chemistry. Instead, that reflooded site will continue to leach nutrients, and that in turn will fuel harmful algal blooms and aquatic invasive plants. We may need to remove that soil to take those nutrients off site, or we may need to put in place a water improvement plan to remove excess nutrients from the water to successfully restore a site. Another challenge is chemical contamination. A former wetland may have been used for agriculture once drained, and if so, it's very likely that fertilizers and pesticides were applied. Fertilizers add yet more nutrients. Pesticides are a very large and diverse group of chemicals and behave in a variety of ways in the soil. So careful consideration of any contaminants found um, should take place so that we can decide if soil needs to be removed or if those contaminants might safely stay on site if it's reflooded. Further complicating things is a need to establish a diverse group of living things in a restoration wetland. Wetlands are incredibly biodiverse, and that biodiversity is important for those ecosystem services. Invasive species already outcompete slower growing native ones, but gain an extra advantage in a disturbed site where there might be extra nutrients. 
those invasives will crowd out natives, making it less biodiverse. Finally, hydrology changes in a site once it's been drained and reflooded. It's unlikely that water will flow through a restoration wetland in the same way that it did historically. The surrounding landscape has often been changed dramatically, and the flow of surface water and water through the ground is unlikely to proceed in the same way that it did before. These challenges are huge, and a thorough restoration project will come at great financial cost. Simply flooding an area and leaving it alone might result in an increase in ecosystem services, but some of these sites actually become detrimental and have harmful effects on nearby water bodies. If, for example, they become a source of phosphorus pollution. However, the cost of a comprehensive restoration project may be prohibitive for a small landowner or local government. In that case, what can we do? We might ask government on a larger scale to step in and provide funding for public parkland. We could promote ecotourism, bringing visitors to an area to enjoy the aspects of that natural environment and generating income as they do. We could look for business partnerships that might allow multiple entities to achieve a goal. We have an example of that right here in Lake County, where a local company is removing nutrient-rich soil from a former wetland turned muck farm in the Emerald de Marsh Conservation Area. The company benefits from the rich organic material, useful for things like potting mix, while the nutrients are removed off-site, making the restoration project more likely to be successful in the long run. The Lake County Water Authority is considering a similar project at the former Lake Denham muck farm, where the water currently being pumped off-site is the largest source of phosphorus pollution into the Harris chain of lakes. Strategic removal of the soil and careful sculpting of the topography at the site to create a diverse aquatic habitat once reflooded might result in a successful restoration project that is cost neutral rather than one that costs taxpayers millions of dollars. There are also programs called Payment for Ecosystem Services. These plans involve paying a landowner for ecosystem services like carbon sequestration, mitigation banking, or water improvement. These schemes are fairly new, but may provide a viable pathway towards an increase in funding for large restoration projects. Whether we choose conservation of existing wetlands or restoration of former wetlands, and hopefully we choose both, we need people to understand the value provided by these amazing ecosystems beyond the monetary value generated for a single landowner. Every single one of us breathes air with oxygen that has recycled through wetlands, drinks water that has been filtered through wetlands, and benefits from the numerous other ecosystem services that those ecosystems provide. Next time you pass a wetland, I challenge you to think of the complex things going on in that ecosystem and to consider how your life might be changed if it were lost. It will take all of us working together to prioritize the survival of these ecosystems so that we may continue to benefit from them. Thank you. <laughs>